بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته معكم الأسد رشيد دالي أسد باحث بكلية الأدب والعلوم الإنسانية بجامعة القضائيات بمراكش شعبة الدراسات الإنجليزية قبل البدء في إلقاء هذه المحاضرة أود بادئ الأمر بأن أتقدم بجزيل الشكر إلى إذاعة مراكش الجهوية لإتاحتها الفرصة للطلبة من أجل متابعة محاضراتهم الجامعية عن بعد كما أود كذلك أن أتقدم بجزيل الشكر إلى السيد رئيس جامعة القضائيات والسيد عميد كلية الأداب والعلوم الإنسانية بمراكش البروفيسور عبد الرحيم بن علي والسادة الأساتذة والإداريين نظرا لمجهوداتهم القيمة لمد يد العون للطلبة حتى تستمر العملية التعليمية التعلمية عن بعد في أحسن الظروف وأتمنى من الله العلي القدير أن تتعافل بلادنا من هذه الجائحة في أسرع وقت حتى تعود الأمور إلى ما كانت عليه ويعود الطلبة إلى مدرجاتهم وأقسامهم In fact today I will talk about the objective and subjective elements of culture This is the, my first lecture and after finishing I will try to provide you with a second or second lecture titled Culture and Health as far of course as coronavirus is concerned. So let's start first with the first lecture. Generally speaking Whenever we talk about the contents of culture, we must in fact talk about the objective elements of culture and the subjective elements of culture. So these are in fact the categories of the contents of culture. Let's start first with the objective elements of culture. So what do we mean by the objective elements of culture? In fact, the objective elements of culture involve objective and explicit elements that are physical, that are touchable, that can be seen, etc. For example, these would include architecture, clothes, food, art, eating utensils, and the like. In today's world, in fact, advertising, text, architecture, art, mass media, television, music, the internet, Facebook, and Twitter are all physical, tangible, and important artifacts of culture. Let's move now to the subjective elements of culture. The subjective elements of culture include all those parts of culture that do not survive people as physical artifacts. Generally, they are abstract, in fact. And let's start with the first element. Values. Values, in fact, are guiding principles that refer to desirable goals that motivate behavior. They define the moral, political, social, economic, aesthetic, or sp spiritual ethics of a person or group of people. In fact, values can also exist on two levels, namely personal values and cultural values. Personal values represent transitional desirable goals that serve as guiding principles in people's lives. While cultural values are shared abstract ideas about what a social collectivity views as good, right and desirable. 
The most well-known approach, in fact, to understanding cultural values comes from work and studies conducted by Geert Hofstede. The latter studied work-related values around the world and to date has reported data from 72 countries involving the responses of more than 117,000 employees of a multinational business organization spanning over 20 different languages and seven occupational levels to his 63 work-related value items. Hofstede suggests that there are five value dimensions that differentiate cultures. The first value dimension is individualism versus collectivism. This dimension refers to the degree to which cultures will encourage, on the one hand, the tendency for people to look after themselves and their immediate family only, or on the other hand, for people to belong to in groups that are supposed to look after its members in exchange for loyalty. So generally speaking, whenever we talk about individualism, we talk about developed countries, Western countries like Canada, like the United States, where the individual is more important than the group. Whenever we talk about collectivism, we talk about countries whereby social relations are very important. The second value dimension, according to Hof City 2001 again, is power distance. This dimension refers to the degree to which cultures will encourage less powerful members of groups to accept that power is distributed unequally. As an example, in a high power distance country, those who need help from society may be viewed as weak and lazy, while the elites view themselves as superior and worthy of luxuries. High power distance is associated with hierarchical organizations with a strict command and control structure. Low power distance tends to lead to flatter organizations with authority distributed to many individuals. High power distance is associated with concentrated decisions making or decision making whereby leaders don't ask for the opinions of subordinates and subordinates rarely challenge leadership decisions. In a low power distance setting, leaders carefully communicate their plans to seek acceptance and engagement from the group. The third value dimension is uncertainty avoidance. In fact, this dimension refers to the degree to which people feel threatened by the unknown. They hate the unknown and they try to avoid it or ambiguous situations and have developed beliefs institutions or rituals to avoid this uncertainty. The fourth dimension or value dimension is masculinity versus femininity. This dimension is featured on one pole by success, by money and things, and on the other pole by caring for others and quality of life. It refers in fact to the distribution of emotional roles between males and females. The fifth dimension 
is egalitarianism. The degree to which cultures emphasize transcending selfish interests in favor of the voluntary promotion of the welfare of others. It fosters equality, social justice, freedom, responsibility, and honesty. Another dimension is harmony, which is the degree to which cultures emphasize fitting in with the environment. It fosters unity with nature, protecting the environment, and a world of beauty. Now, let's move to the second element in subjective cultures, which is beliefs. It's important, of course, to provide a definition germane to beliefs. A belief is a proposition that is regarded as true. And people of different cultures have different beliefs. So generally, we regard our beliefs mostly to be true, in fact. Recently, cultural beliefs have been, in fact, studied under the concept known as social axioms. These social axioms are general beliefs, in fact, about oneself, the social and physical environment, and the spiritual world. Now, the third element is norms. Norms are generally accepted standards of behavior for any cultural group. It is the behavior that members of any culture have defined as the most appropriate in any given, given situation. All cultures give guidelines about how people are expected to behave through norms. For instance, in some cultures, people wear little or no clothing, while in others, people normally cover almost all of their bodies. The fourth element is attitudes. The latter are evaluations of things occurring in ongoing thoughts about the things or stored in memory. Examples include believing that democracy is the best form of government. In many other cultures, especially in the past, people believed that most people aren't capable of understanding government and that countries are best ruled by kings who are very religious or spiritually advanced. The fifth element is worldviews. Cultures also differ importantly in cultural worldviews, and these are culturally specific belief systems about the world. They contain attitudes, beliefs, opinions, and values about the world. They are assumptions people have about their physical and social realities. For example, the American culture fosters a worldview centering on personal control, that you are in control of your life, destiny, and happiness. Many other cultures do not foster this worldview. Instead, one's life may be in the hands of God, fate, or super or the supernatural. Now, let's move to understanding culture in perspective. And here we'll start first with universals and culture specifics. And it's important, of course, here to shed light on 
two crucial concepts. Ethics, it's E-T-I-C-S, not ethics with T-H. So we have ethics and emics. Cultural psychologists, in fact, have a vocabulary for talking about universal and culture-specific psychological processes. Ethics refer to those processes that are consistent and similar across different cultures. That is, ethics refer to universal psychological processes. Emics refer to those processes that are different across cultures. Emics, therefore, refer to culture-specific processes. Barry, 1969, was one of the first to use these linguistic concepts to describe universal versus culturally relative aspects of behavior. Although we are all born with the same toolkits, in fact, our cultures help to shape those toolkits and inform us about how we use the tools. So we can all make sounds, but cultures teach us how to shape those sounds into words and how to arrange those words into the different languages we humans speak. We all have emotions, but cultures tell us what to become emotional about and what to do about it when we are emotional. We all have a sense of morality, but cultures differ on what is right and wrong, good and bad. Thus, culture influences how we communicate, how we think, how we make decisions, how we plan for the future, and how we solve our problems. It dictates about politeness and etiquette. It defines religion and taboos. Because cultures exist in different regions of the world, they all do these things differently. That's why we see cultural differences in these emics. Basically, people around the world are very similar in their basic needs to get along, find a mate, achieve goals, and carry out the basic functions of living. Cultures find ways to allow people to address those needs. Because cultures exist in different regions of the world, with different histories, they often find different ways to address those same needs. Now, it's time to move to the second lecture, which is titled Culture and Health. So before tackling culture and how it influences health, health and disease processes, First, we need to examine exactly what we mean by health. And as I said at the outset, it's very important to shed light on this topic also due to what is taking place in the world today. The confinement. So people are suffering, etc., etc. So that's why it's really important and it's crucial to shed light on this topic as well. More than six years ago, the World Health Organization developed a definition at the International Health Conference. In fact, they defined health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Between brackets, infirmity means illness. This is, of course, the definition of World Health Organization. Concepts of health may differ not only between cultures, but also within a pluralistic culture, such as the United States or Canada. Molatu and Berry, 2001, cite the example of Native Americans 
who based on their religion have a holistic view of health and who consider good health to be living in harmony with oneself and one's environment. Uh, Yurkovic, 2008, point out that while the World, World Health Organization definition of health includes physical, mental, and social well-being, spiritual well-being is not mentioned. So spiritual, the spiritual well-being is also very important. In Native American cultures, however, spiritual well-being, feeling connected to and in balance with the spiritual world is a cornerstone of, of good health. Now, let's talk or let's move to sociocultural influences on physical health and disease. And we'll start first with cultural dimensions and diseases. In fact, Marmot and Syme, 1976, studied Japanese Americans and the contribution of cultural lifestyles to the development of heart disease. They classified 3,809 subjects into groups according to how traditionally Japanese they were. Of course, here we're talking about uh, speaking Japanese at home, retain traditional Japanese or retaining traditional Japanese values and behaviors and the like. They found that those who were the most Japanese had the lowest incidence of coronary heart disease, comparable to the incidence in Japan. The group that was the least Japanese had a three to five times higher incidence. Triandis et al. 1988 took this finding one step further using the individualism, collectivism, cultural dimension and examining its relationship to heart disease across eight different cultural groups. European Americans, the most individualistic of the eight groups, had the highest rate of heart attacks. Trappists, monks, who were the least individualistic, had the lowest rate. Triandis et al. 1988 suggested that social support or isolation was the most important factor that explained this relationship. In fact, to simplify it, people who live in more collectivistic cultures may have access to stronger and deeper social ties with others than do people in individualistic cultures. These social relationships in turn, are considered a buffer against the stress and strain of living, reducing the risk of cardiovascular diseases. Still, this study is limited in that they have focused on only one, on one aspect of culture, which is individualism versus collectivism ignoring other factors such as power distance, uncertainty avoidance, masculinity versus femininity, etc. Matsumoto and Fletcher, 1996, investigated this possibility by examining the relationship among multiple dimensions of culture and multiple disease processes. Obesity is another a health problem that was studied by a number of scholars from different countries around the globe. These scholars, in fact, wanted to demonstrate and reveal the relationship between obesity and between culture to illuminate in certain cultures, beauty is directly related to obesity, while obesity is considered as a disease in certain cultures. Um, finally, I would like to thank you for your attention.
So thank you again. Bye.